Hello and welcome to episode 6. Yes, it's been a while since episode 5, but hopefully if you're watching the show on our spangly new website development, you can see we've been busy. Yep, the new site is being designed to give you a better viewing experience however you watch the show. So, whether you're watching us on the move on your mobile, or sat back with a beer at home on your 50-inch internet TV, we've got you covered. Right, enough of all that mumbo, let's get into episode 6 because it's a belter. Coming up this episode... Injured and off the water for 9 months, 5-time world champion Aaron Hadlow joins us to give us his views on the new PKRA format and more. We find out about the roles of best designers Peter Stewie and Jordi Modelel. Andre Philippe's latest film, Island Time, also features Sam Light and Jake Kelsick and has almost 150,000 views on YouTube. We try and find out the secrets of its success from Dre himself. We have the first part of an instructional series taking you from the basic unhooked back roll to the back mode with British ripper Sam Light. Who wants a new surfboard then? We give away the North Wham and put the best short stick up for grabs. Ruben Lenton and Lewis Craven tell us about the Len 10 Mega Loop Challenge in Cape Town, and we play you out with June Discovery, an excellent video from the Best Odyssey. Five-time world champion Aaron Hadlow was planning to make a return to PKRA World Tour competition this year, but sadly we'll have to wait for that exciting comeback until at least 2013, as Aaron has torn his ACL and damaged the meniscus in his right knee while riding in South Africa in February. Yes, he was motivated by a change in the scoring format, rewarding quality over quantity, but unfortunately it's a nasty injury that will keep him out for nine months. But Aaron always has plenty to say, so Annalise caught up with him when he was back in the UK for his operation and rehab. Good body. So Aaron, thank you very much for joining us. So first of all, the obvious question is, there's crutches here, what happened? Well, I was out in Cape Town and at the beginning of February I had took a pretty harsh landing. Nothing too serious, it was quite a normal little session but I was uh, I was shooting for Red Bull on the Phantom camera and we were getting some nice shots but ended up just landing a bit tweaked and collapsed my knee and tore my ACL and quite a big tear through my lateral meniscus which has uh, left me on crutches for about a month or so and then about eight or nine months rehab. I was lucky that being sponsored by Red Bull, they give me so much good support. The turnover, they flew me about. I made the decision on the Friday, was home on the Saturday, and in consultancy Monday and operation on Tuesday. So with their support, it's been really cool because they've got me some of the best doctors around, the best knee surgeon possibly in the world. And uh, so that, that gives me the confidence that it'll be all right. So the word is that you were actually training quite hard to get back onto the world tour, is that right? Yeah, I mean, I pretty much made the decision over Christmas time and spent December, January really pushing quite hard out in Cape Town. And how, how come you left that in the first place? I think at the time I just needed a break psychologically and it's quite stagnant. My riding wasn't really... It was progressing but on the same tricks and since I was a kid I've been here kiting since 2000 and you know I remember sessions when I'd learn like five ten tricks in a, in a go and that's, yeah, what, yeah. that's what I loved the most and I kind of just wasn't learning anything new and sort I kinda, of plateaued a bit. Yeah I wanted to take a step back and maybe I, there was only four events in the year that year and uh, I thought maybe I could be more productive doing my own thing and you know switching over to boots had to learn all my tricks again basically and that gave me inspiration and the motivation to kite again. I always was going to come back to the PKR at some point and I just wanted it to settle down, more events to come up and uh, and for the f eventually for the format to change and that's what happened this year and kind of what I thought well riding boots and I got to a point where I felt like I mastered boots and I was moving forward in my riding on in the boots and with the format changing and only counting seven tricks out of you know, out of 12 attempts and those being scored in a certain way, for me, I thought it was the right time to come back. Yeah, that's cool. Now, who, if you had been competing, who were you looking forward to competing against the most? Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a battle between Alex and and uh, Yuri, for sure, from what I can see and what I've seen. And it is going to be really interesting because 
Yuri obviously done so well last year, but with the format change, it's gonna. I think it will probably benefit Alex for now, but obviously, Yuri is really adaptive to everything, and he's been kiting a long time, and his style still really suits this new format too. So it is going to be close and really exciting. Just a shame I'm not going to be there with him. I oh know. I guess you. I'm thinking you're probably going to follow it quite closely though. Yeah, definitely. I'll probably even turn up at a few events this year to support and just see how the format actually does work out. You know, to lose a year is quite quite hard to take, but you never know. I think a year of not kiting is going to leave me really motivated to come back. We also asked Aaron lots of your questions that you sent in for him on Facebook. See him answer those next episode. And you can read a feature-length interview I did with him in Kite World Issue 57, which is just about out now. I got to spend a month out in Cape Town again this winter, testing gear with Bully for Kite World. It's a tough job, Jim. I just don't know how you do it. Thanks, Annalise. Finally, some appreciation. Now, Cape Town is a phenomenal place to visit over the Northern Hemisphere winter with dozens of kite surfing beaches to choose from, a range of conditions and the epic Cape Doctor howling winds. It's no wonder you can find lots of product development teams out there at that time. Well, in between sunbathing sessions in the wine regions, Jim managed to catch up with Peter Stewie and Jordi Modelel, chief gear designers with Best Kiteboarding, to find out a bit more about the development process and why they like Cape Town so much. So some of your favourite spots, I mean obviously we're on the the main strip here in, in Bloberg. I mean it's, I guess it's about eight kilometres isn't it from sunset um, down towards Big Bay. Uh, is this where you do the majority of your testing or do you head elsewhere somewhere a bit more private? Well a little bit of both I think, it depends on where we're working on, what we're working on, if there's a lot of testing and running forth and back with different kites then of course this is like a perfect place to go because we're living just next door and uh, we can go three, four sessions a day but then also there's a couple of other places up to Namibia where you can uh, find yeah. <laughs> nice a little bit more peace. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh -huh. And you've got a new team rider this year, Gisela. I saw her on the beach the other day. Uh, she's been out doing some testing. Have you had the whole team out or just, just Gisela? Yeah, no, we had the whole team. Oh, not the whole team, but uh, Michael Schitzhofer was also, or oh, she's still here. And this is also one of the reasons why we come. It's really good to have like the team around you because they give us so much feedback and help when we test kites too. So yeah, it was very nice to have them around. Uh, so we're March now, um, so I'm guessing that you guys are wrapping up your 2013 lineup. Whereabouts are you in, in that? No, that's the kite designer. No, it's well, no, it's, <laughs> you have also products to develop, so um, <laughs> now we are, let's say, three quarters. <laughs> still, still a lot of work to do, but um, uh, we are quite, uh, this year, we're quite uh, progressed in the development at this date. So we would, we would see 2013 gear usually around September, October, is that about right? So, so when would you have to be finished? Um, well, we have to be finished actually in April, um, but uh, the, because then you have the whole uh, system behind, you have to produce the product, you have to ship the product and then you have to distribute the product, so and uh, that takes a couple of months um, and in order to, uh, for the product to be on the shelf in, in September, um, we need to be finished in April. Yeah. So then, come April, is that a bit of time off? Where, where do you head after after that? Yeah, well, we have um, we then production starts, and then we uh, for production starts we normally go to the to the factories and to to ensure that everything is going um, accordingly how it should. And uh, after that, yeah, we have like a little bit of a of a break. I mean, this year we have the the. Um, the KSB tour uh, coming for the wave riding um, a competition to our beach in Portugal, which will be quite exciting. Uh, yeah, you spend a lot of time in Ginchô, don't you, as well? Uh, exactly. Uh, we spent uh, in the in the northern hemisphere summer. We spent uh, in Portugal in Ginchô, and then in the southern uh, and the northern hemisphere winter we spent here in Cape Town. So you guys have been here pretty much four months. Have you got any sessions from here that really stand out in your mind? Maybe Cape Point, Misty Cliffs, or is it just riding here every day that makes it really special? 
I mean, the great thing is you find, uh, depending what how the wind is, how the waves are, you find like good conditions um, all along the coast. And but sure, there are some there are some very nice spots, um, basically from from here up north, um, or also Misty Cliffs is a spot we really like and enjoy Scarborough Misty Cliffs with sunset area. It's a beautiful, stunning setting, and um, and um, you find different conditions uh, uh, compared to here, different water color. Um, very enjoyable. Yeah. There's a little bit for every everyone here, isn't there? I mean, Misty Cliffs and Cape Point, you've got to be a bit more on your game. You're kind of out there on your own a little bit, but the waves are amazing, aren't they? Yeah, yeah it's uh, it's an amazing spot. Uh, it's uh, a little bit more risky, maybe. <laughs> more wind, bigger waves, uh, bigger fish. <laughs> it's by the crayfish factory, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. But no, it's all good. It's uh, it's very nice. And you have, like, I mean, you can go. Yeah, flat water in the lagoon or in Langebahn and um, so very good variety of conditions to test different product and to enjoy the sport. Uh, well, I think we've got some winds coming back in over the next few days, so no doubt you guys will be busy. And uh, thanks very much for your time and we'll catch up with you soon. Thank you very much. Yeah. Come to Gincho. Visit we'll come us. to Gincho. <laughs> what are you doing, Jim? I'm just watching Island Time. It's a film with Dre, Sam Light, Jake Kelsikin. But it's got 150,000 views. Wow. Yeah, I reckon we need some tips. Yeah. film we did it was called we did nothing and it had a bit of a script and a bit of a storyline but we kind of wanted to to step away from that this time so we decided that you know what we're not gonna we're not gonna plan anything we're not gonna have a script we'll just get shabs to roll camera on everything that we do on a regular basis you know if it's Windy, we'll go kiteboarding wherever it's good, and if it's not windy, we'll we'll find something else to do. You know, we'll go boating or go hang out at the beach or whatever. We were pretty surprised because the film got a lot of views pretty quickly. Um, in the first couple of days, it got 50,000 views, and within a week, it had over 100,000 views. So it's pretty awesome to see that people around the world enjoyed the video and, and enjoy watching what we do down here in the islands. I mean, basically, it kind of sucks. You wake up every morning and look out the curtain and it's sunny outside, then you go to the beach and the water's warm and crystal clear and sparkling. And, you know, I, I don't know how we're supposed to work in these kind of conditions. <laughs> I think the film represents the style of kiteboarding that we're into. Um, we like to keep our kite pretty low and that allows us to really feel gravity. Um, we also like to be pretty locked in, so we wear boots and this allows us to land really hard and fast and it also gives us a lot of leverage over our board so that we can really press it out on the sliders. I think that if you start riding in vests and boots then you probably get more girls. Um, it tends to happen. Big ups to all the kite show viewers out there and thanks for watching Island Time. Now go kiting! I've got an idea, Annalise. What do you think? <sighs> Here's what's coming up in the next bit. Sam Light's back roll to back Mob series. We give away the North Wham surfboard and launch the best short stick competition. 
We hear from Ruben Lenton about his Megaloop event in South Africa, as well as event winner Lewis Craven, and they talk us through Ruben's mega wipeout. And finish you off with a stunning mini movie by Gavin and Jody from the amazing Best Odyssey. The model is back and is looking better than ever before. We've kept the Suprema Woodcore and the lightweight, high strength PVC around, so it serves up better pop than ever. Stands width and the rail shape have been changed and tweaked, so the board goes better through the job and it's easier to handle the rail when you are overpowered. The Yamada V3 is my go-to board for new school and free ride. Riding at the cable is a great crossover and it can really help to keep improving your unhooked riding when there's no wind. Unlike kiting, the conditions are virtually perfect every time, which can help you work out what you're doing wrong. Now Sam Light spends almost as much time at the cable as he does at the beach, so we headed to the Blue Rock Cable Park in Cape Town to help break down his key points of the back roll and back to toe in this, the first part of his back mode series. I like to break down tricks and I find at the cable because it's always exactly the same. You can really break down each individual trick and work out where you're going wrong and what you need to do. Okay. Um, but at the same time, you can't cheat with the kite. You can have your kite higher to learn new tricks. Cable's pretty much 100% commitment. Yeah. Um, yeah. And but it, it pays off, it's just good yeah. fun. And I found it's really helped with my opposite direction as well. Okay. Um, because most cables go right foot forward and it kind of forces you to do another foot forward and learn different yeah. ways, different tricks, different ways. So what are some of the differences, just for people to bear in mind when we're showing them the cable move as opposed to the kite? Um, to be honest, for a back mobe it's very similar, apart from your point of pull it would be it's a bit lower different. than All right. normal. So we're going to start with the back roll. Yep. At the cable. Uh, quite simple move in kiting. Simple move in cable? Not necessarily. Um, any air trick is hard on the cable. Yeah. Um, but when you come from a kiting background, definitely it is easier. It is easier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, it's a basic move and an important move. So you're coming into the trick here. Yeah. Tell us what's happening. Okay, well, you know, I like to break it down into the key points. Like when I'm coming into my move, I'm, th I'm thinking about different things I need to do. Um, and the few things I'm thinking about in a back roll is keeping my arms in, um, which basically keeps your point of rotation lower in your body. Yeah. If you have your arms out, a lot of people edge as hard as they can and let their arms out straight away. Yeah. So your point of rotation becomes too high, so you have to do a lot bigger trick 
or you don't make it round. If you keep your arms in and low, you'll spin a lot quicker and um, find it a lot easier and go higher as well. Um, other points are to really scoop your edge. Um, it's very different to a Rayleigh. Um, that's one thing why I like using no fins because you can. I like to change the edge um, for different tricks in a bat mode. Because you almost want to do half of the trick on the water. Yeah. Throw your head back and really scoop your edge around so you've completed most of the trick before you even take off. Okay. But that is the point where you can let your arms out, where it's important to keep them in, so it just pops you around and continues your rotation. <clears throat> so you've got your rotation, you've popped. We're coming into land. How do we slow it all down, get the landing right? I think that's something that um, people have a bit of trouble with in their first back rolls anyway. They either over-rotate, under-rotate. Yeah. yeah. The worst thing you want to do on a back roll um, is under-rotate because it's, you know, backside edge or your nose and they're the painful ones. Um, so again, I would really think about keeping your arms in because it will ha help it a lot more landing because yeah. you'll, you'll just, it's, you'll be more balanced. And always spot your landing. Um, it's an important one that you can never overlook. Spotting your landing is really important. Okay. A lot of people find back to toe size easier on the cable and I think they are kiting as well. The nature uh, of a back roll is sometimes halfway around it can slow you slow your rotation and you can find it easier to spot your landing. Whereas yeah. a back to toe, you open yourself up so it's really easy to see and okay. I think it's easy to control as well. Okay. Let's have a look at this one. It's more of a flippy rotation. Yeah. In the way that a back flip is easier than a front flip on a trampoline. Um, I think that's the best way to look at it because the front flips, you know, it's easier to throw because it's your first front flip. Yeah. Um, whereas a back flip's harder to throw because it's backwards, like a back to toe, because it's more over your head, but it's easier to land because you're coming in and you can see everything. Okay. So key points again, barring close. Yeah, always good to keep the barring close. Um, and you change your hips. This one, you tend to, with a back roll, you have it to your front hip to keep that direction going in the same way. Um, whereas back to toe, you move it to your back hip, and all you do in the air is literally just pull it to the other hip, okay. and it'll automatically bring you around to toe side. Yeah. What a lot of people make the mistake of doing is they come around the corner and just keep edging, whereas yeah. you don't really want to do that as a, you don't get the full force of the cable. If you come around the corner and cut the opposite way first, as you can see here, I yeah. cut to the left, yeah. and then back to the right. So when you're really sunk in your edge, you're going directly underneath the cable, okay. um, which makes it easy to spin. Because what you want to do, it's like a kite. When you load up against your kite, it's creating the tension in the lines mm -hmm. which pulls you, whereas mm -hmm. on the cable, you're cre creating the tension in the cable. Yeah. Um, so the longer you can edge for, the higher you're going to go. The more it's very similar, like... but kiting, it's a very short cut, always. Right. Okay. I mean, you, there is a few moves where it's a longer cut and a back move is one, but most of all, it's short, just because the kite pops forward very quickly. Yeah. Um, whereas on a cable, you, you really want to do a progressive edge. So if you suddenly just edge really hard, then it can actually pull back at you. Yeah, yeah. So you want to sort of slowly sink your edge in until right at the end is when you're edging the hardest. Okay. Yeah, but kiting, you can just sink it in whatever. It doesn't really matter. Off you go. And yeah. an angle helps with the kite. It's slightly higher when you're learning. You pull you up a yeah, bit more. Yeah, yeah. It, it makes the landing again, a bit harder. Yeah, it depends from kite to kite. Um, but yeah, higher kite's always going to help. Yeah, you can't really go wrong. I mean, is that kite higher. Is that some like promoting a high kite? <laughs> <coughs> Last episode, North kindly put up their Sublime Wham surfboard for grabs. The question you had to answer was, who is North's surfboard shaper? The answer is, of course, Sky Solback, and the lucky winner is Ida Danielson from Sweden. Well done. What a prize. Yes, but we have another fantastic surfboard prize to give away. No way. Yes way. Here is Kristen Berzer with the details. I'm Christine Böse and this is the best kiteboarding short stick surfboard which is up for grabs this episode. It's an all-around surfboard suitable for tearing up anything from small to medium-sized waves. And to win this board, all you have to do is answer one very simple question. Best kiteboarding signed on a very successful world champion kiteboarder at the end of 2011. What is her name?
back to Annalise and Jim, who will explain you how to enter. To enter, go to our Facebook fan page, go to the episode 6 tab there and enter your details on the form. Good luck. Back in February, Ruben Lenton organised his first Mega Loop challenge with Red Bull at Big Bay in Cape Town. Some of the best Mega Loopers in the world were assembled to throw mental big airs and ballsy kite loops, eventually leading to British rider Lewis Craven taking the win. Jim caught up with Ruben after the event. We also got Aaron to interview Lewis and the boys break down Ruben's massive wipeout during his demonstration for the crowd. Hi, I'm Ruben Lenten, 23 years old, from Holland. We're here in Big Bay, Cape Town, South Africa. One of my favorite kiteboarding locations in the world. So I've selected 24 riders who can compete in the Lent 10 Mega Loop Challenge. It's all aimed at Mega Loops, which is my signature move. This uh, move is the way how you produce the most power out of the kite by pulling it straight through the power zone. What more can I ask for than power from a kite? And this year you've uh, organised uh, the Lenten Mega Loop Challenge that happened two weeks ago. Uh, it seemed to be a big success, good Cape Town wins coming in for it and uh, you had quite a few riders here as well. Yeah, that's true, the Lenten Mega Loop Challenge has been on my mind quite a while. Like bringing back the wow factor in the sport is something I really want to, want to do, you know. All about Mega Loops, three judges, four riders on the water, uh, just scoring the biggest Mega Loops basically and putting on a good show for the spectators. So that was really good to work on, you know? Yeah, no, it was really good. And how, how long have you been thinking about coming up with an event like that? I mean, obviously it's been part of your signature moves for quite a long time, but um, a as an event itself? Yeah, well, all the time after the Red Bull King of the Year basically stopped in 2005. That was uh, all about Big Air as well, you know, the event in Hawaii that Red Bull always put on. That kind of stopped and... We missed it, you know, it kind of faded out and people started focusing on technical tricks, low wake style moves, which is cool, but it's hard for the public to follow. And for me, kiteboarding is all about freedom, you know, just go as big as you can. And that's what we try to do with this event as well. So I've definitely been thinking about it a long time, but it just takes a long time to get through all those steps with Red Bull, myself, uh, things change, you know, but uh, it finally came together well and the format works. And so. yeah. You had a good judging team, there was yourself. Yeah. Aaron up in the judging box and Greg Kleiss who's a local rider from here. Uh, how did the event go for you? Have you got any particular highlights that stand out? I couldn't ask for more actually. The wind was kind of sketchy from the beginning. It was like dead still in the morning. Yeah. And uh, then the wind slowly came up and actually reached quite a good point where we saw some big wipeouts and big jumps. So I think that's what it was all about, you know. So Rick Jensen and Lewis Crather and Johnny Arachno uh, Sam Light, they were all in the final, four buddies of mine and four friends amongst them too. So uh, they decided to split split the prize money before they went out on the heat and just put on a good show. So I think that was definitely one of the highlights. Well, to be honest with you, Aaron, I thought I was going to steam straight through to the final, but Rick, one of my friends, Rick Jensen, he was in the same heat, yeah. and he threw one of the biggest kite loops of the day. Really got the kite stuck down low. Yeah, I, th I think he hurt his knee doing it as well. Yeah, I was almost, almost relieved in a way going into the final with how big, big he was going that day. But no, he gave me a hard time, so I had to go back through the repertage system and, and luckily I got through that and into the final but I think I'll throw it out there hands down that final was the finest final I've ever been in. Well yeah I mean with, with, the, with the high wind stuff it's definitely risky but I, I personally think that with the wind sort of touching on 
30 knots. That's the most. Line. That's the most dangerous time because you can't get the height to get up, and you you know you're going to drop out, yeah. and hit the ground. But Ruben's crash. Wow. There's not many times as a commentator I have not known what to say. Yeah. And that was one of them. I think the beach went totally silent. So I mean, I was up there as well because it was his demo. He had to go out and show the public what it's all about, and you know it's his event. So. I think after that crash, usually you would just you would come in and have to have a little minute with yourself. But he had no option but to go back out, did he? It, it was it was funny asking him at the end actually, like, you know, how how did you get back out there? He looked us straight in the face and said, "I've got to. I had to. I had to go back out. <laughs> he had to go back, which is true in a way." Yeah, definitely. But so Brad, who was emceeing at the event was doing a really good job of uh, hyping up all the excitement for when you did your demo which was just before the final there's loads of people on the beach do you do, do you feel quite a lot of pressure to perform in that environment i mean obviously you were expected to do the biggest and baddest mega loops and uh, is that all right for you yeah for me the day was actually quite hectic you know i was uh, out of my zone normally i chill out a little bit before the session listen to some music and i was judging talking to people doing some interviews doing photos and I went on my on the water with my 9 meter, which is not actually my favorite mega loop guy, but I know I have my shit down and I can pull whatever I need to pull. But then as soon as I go for my first jump with like lots of spectators on the beach and the guys having a break, I go there whoop, and I take off and I just get like a little sketch and that actually threw me off a little bit and then I got a rewind in my jump and then I land and I thought all was good and then my nose just dived and I did a full cartwheel with my face in the water like bam bam bam. It was a proper ragdolling, I've never seen anything like it, but you brushed yourself down, yeah. took, took a minute or so to get your head back together and then went back out like a true pro. Yeah, it wasn't pleasant, but actually I didn't feel much because the adrenaline was just rushing through my body and I just had to get this demo over and done with that. But I actually didn't hurt myself and I think I got away safe there. So oh, It was good, it was good to watch. <laughs> nice, glad you liked it. You are heading off from South Africa today, where are you heading to? Oh, that made me think of travelling and packing again. No, I've been here for two months now, time has been flying by, but been achieving quite a bit and heading to Australia actually this afternoon. Uh, going to Perth for a week, then to Sydney for a few days, Melbourne for a few days, then to Tasmania, where I'm actually running a pretty cool project with Red Bull. Going to search for some of the biggest cliffs to jump off and I hope that's all going to turn out well. I'll wear my safety helmet, don't worry Jim. Good luck, we do worry about you Ruben. <laughs> Everybody worries about me, ah, except me. Ah. Thanks to everyone who contributed to this episode, especially Best and Iron for sponsoring it, and also to Aka Car Rentals, Realty 24 SA, Cape Town Guru, and the Endless Summer House in Cape Town. And don't forget to enter the Best Short Stick competition on Facebook, and to have a good old route around our new website. If you like it, please help us by sharing it. For the last few years, Gavin McClurg and Jodie McDonald have contributed a regular column to Kite World from their phenomenal adventures running the Best Odyssey, a five-year kiteboarding expedition. Playing us out this episode, we've picked their excellent June Discovery video, which has made it to the final round of the epic Theatre Film Awards on Earth Preservation. We're sure you'll enjoy it. Now, come on Annalise. Come on, just think about it. Think of the views. <sighs> ben won't mind. No, Jim. Loser. To us, you know, the, the exploration and the expedition really starts when you leave the beaten path. Our journey began 12 years ago. We set out by sail to kite surf, surf, and paraglide where no one had before. A lot of people before us have sailed around the world, you know, that's nothing new. But we're not out here to follow in people's footsteps. As we were sailing into the Bazaruda Archipelago, Jody and I kind of at the same time looked at each other and went, you've got to be kidding me, we can fly that. Pleased to meet you, you opened up my eyes. Let me know what's inside. Wanna know you. Wanna read this?
Expeditions aren't about five-star hotels and pampered cruises, you know, expeditions are about hardship and difficulty, but when you get through it and find a place like we did in Mozambique and you're the first to paraglide a spot that never has before, it makes it all worth it. When we set off to sail around the world, what we hoped to find were untouched coral gardens and lots of marine life and deserted beaches and deserted places. While that does exist, you do find that. What you also find a lot of and more than you can possibly imagine is trash and plastic and waste runoff and destroyed coral and seas that have been completely fished out. It's really sad. In 12 years that we've been out here, we've also seen a big change from the beginning and the end. I can't imagine a world where these things no longer exist. We left the Indian Ocean and rounded Cape of Good Hope and the southern tip of Africa. We sailed 4,500 miles to here in Cape Verde and we're just uh, in search of wind and waves. People ask Jody and I all the time while we're still out here, you know, what can there be to see after 12 years of roaming around the earth? But when you're out here, you realize just how much potential there is and how many places there are to see, I and mean, we barely scratched the surface. We've got to keep going. understood why people seek the comfort zone. I mean, what's comfortable about knowing what's going to happen every day? I'd rather have no idea. 